things furiously. <laughs> I'm just going to wait for the queue. Yeah, Thank I'm you. OK, great. And so we are absolutely delighted to welcome uh, to the school Sir Malcolm Rifkin to speak on the decline of the West. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Karthik Ramada. I'm a professor here at the school and the director of the MPP. Delighted to see many of the MPP students here in the groom, as well as a number of uh, members from the wider Oxford community. Welcome to the Blavatnik School if this is your first time here. Uh, this event is actually thanks to a connection from one of our own. Uh, Anthony Liveris is a new MPP student who uh, first proposed the idea and then made uh, all of the various logistics happen to bring Sir Malcolm here. So thank you, Anthony, for making that happen. Uh, uh, very quickly, a brief bio on Sir Malcolm. Of course, uh, not much needed because he's such a well-known personality. But amongst others, other accomplishments, he's one of the longest serving um, uh, ministers in uh, the British government uh, uh, for the last uh, 150 years. Um, I wasn't there that long. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> over the last 150 years. Let's put it that way. Um, but, but it might have seemed on some days as being 150 years, including some interesting times in, uh, in British history, such as the Falklands War, uh, and at least the period leading up to the handover in Hong Kong, uh, two themes that might be uh, parts of what uh, sort of feature in today's conversation. Um, and uh, more recently, he has uh, been a visiting professor uh, in the Department of War Studies at King's College in London. Uh, and he uh, was also, until recently, the chairman of the Parliamentary Committee on Intelligence and Security, so the committee that oversaw the security apparatus and the uh, intelligence agencies, uh, MI6, GCHQ, and the like. So we're delighted to have Sir Malcolm join us. Um, the way this will work is Sir Malcolm will speak for about 25 minutes to about 6 o'clock, and then uh, we will open it up for questions. Uh, so if you have questions, do start uh, preparing them. And then because this event is being uh, live streamed on YouTube, if you do have a question, uh, raise your hand. I'll call on you, and we'll have to wait for a mic to get to you. Uh, and then do wait for the mic. And then, of course, uh, well, that's when we, um, uh, we, we wait to hear from you. So Thank you very much. Away. Thank you. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I must thank the chairman for his unique introductory remarks. Uh, I recall reading once that President Lyndon Johnson on such an occasion said, thank you, uh, that was the sort of introduction which my father would have enjoyed and my mother would have believed. <laughs> so I, I, am, uh, I am grateful. I'm grateful to you. Uh, I must make it abundantly clear, of course, despite my bio details, I am not a serving minister in the government. Uh, I am a private citizen, and that gives me the complete freedom that goes with total impotence, uh, and uh, it's something which one can easily exploit. We say in the United Kingdom that a minister knows when he is retired. It's when you climb into the back of your car and it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> I am going to allow, obviously, my remarks to be limited in the way that it was described. Uh, and in fact, I think it's best described as saying I will follow the wise precedent of King Henry VIII of England, who apparently said to each of his six wives, please don't worry, I don't intend to keep you long. <laughs> <laughs> so to my, to my subject, which is the decline of the West, but there's a question mark at the end, and that question mark is, of course, very, very important. The first time I ever heard Henry Kissinger speak was in London in the late 1980s. And I can't emulate the gravelly voice, so it'll have to be said in a different accent. But he began his speech, this is about 1988, 1989, he said, uh, when Adam and Eve were expelled from the Garden of Eden, never to return, as they left the garden, Adam turned to his wife Eve and said, you know, my dear, we are living in an age of transition. <laughs> so it's a phrase that has quite a long pedigree, uh, and people tend to think at this moment in time, uh, with the, the growth of China, uh, with the resurgence of Russia, with, dare I say it, Brexit, with President Trump in the White House, and a whole host of other examples, it is obviously a pretty extraordinary period, uh, which has led, for reasons that we will go into this evening, uh, to the proposition uh, that the West, however you define the West, 
uh, has been for some time and perhaps it may be accelerating its decline and we are, the world is entering into a totally new phase. Now, I know it's conventional quite often to go back to end of the Cold War 1989 as a sort of starting point. But the point I want to make in relation to that date is that there was not one event that happened 1989-1990. There were actually three separate interconnected events, each of which has ongoing consequences very relevant to what we're thinking about today. The first was obviously the end of the Cold War itself, which at any time could have turned into a, a nuclear Third World War with nuclear weapons that could have literally destroyed the whole planet. And when we think of all the problems we have today, let's not lose sight of the fact that the world is not safe, but it's a damn sight safer uh, than when you had two ideologies, each of which claimed to be global, each of which had aspirations to expand its control, and which were armed to the teeth with uh, literally thousands and thousands of nuclear strategic uh, weapons. So that was one event that happened. The second event, linked to it but separate, was the end of communism as a significant ideology. Russia under Putin is not communist, uh, nor does communism as an ideology in reality exist anywhere. China is ruled by a communist party, as is uh, North Korea, but they're not really communist in any meaningful economic or sociological sense. I'm not saying they're Western capitalists, but they are essentially dictatorships of a very substantial kind with a veneer of communist rhetoric and, and perhaps some ideological leftovers from the past. So I, communism has disappeared. And the question why it disappeared, obviously it could be a lecture in itself, but ultimately it couldn't deliver. It just could not produce the social and economic benefits that was manifest. I, I was present when uh, Gorbachev met Margaret Thatcher, uh, the famous meeting when she ended up saying he's the man with whom we can do business. And what Gorbachev was most influenced by not just in the United Kingdom, but when he subsequently went to other Western countries, was the sheer profusion of economic choices that were available, not just to the wealthy, but to ordinary uh, people. Uh, somebody once remarked that communism only works uh, either in heaven, where they do not need it, or in hell, where they've got it already. Uh, <laughs> so be it. Uh, the world has not had an alternative ideology I'll come back to what it does have, but it doesn't have an alternative ideology, a world view that is relevant and potentially attractive to people throughout the world. Uh, and that is what, of course, led to Mr. Fukuyama talking about the end of history. Uh, I prefer an alternative phrase, as one door closes, another slams in your face. <laughs> as one problem is resolved, it provides opportunities for new problems to come forward. But I said there were three things that happened in 1989 and around about that time. So the first was the end of the Cold War. The second was the end of the communist ideology as an alternative to capitalism. The third is the one that in some ways is most obviously with us today. It was the end of Europe's last empire, the Russian Empire. Now, of course, Europe had been full of empires, the British, the French, the Dutch, Belgium, and so forth, Spanish. The Russian was the last one. Why? Because it was a different kind of empire. It wasn't in other continents, except, of course, Siberia and Asia, but it wasn't across the oceans. It was an expansion of Russia itself. Somebody once said Britain had an empire, Russia was an empire. And we are all, I suspect most of us at any rate, are familiar with Mr. Putin's remark uh, that the greatest geopolitical disaster of his lifetime, he didn't say it was the end of communism, he said it was the end of the, Russian, the Soviet Union as a state. And that, of course, has contributed to his ambitions, particularly in Ukraine, uh, but also elsewhere uh, that we have currently seen. So these have an ongoing impact. I said as one door closes, another slams in your face, because we saw, long before the current debates, we saw the rebirth of nationalism in Europe, uh, in the Balkans in particular, in Yugos former Yugoslavia, but also elsewhere in Eastern Europe. They had never entirely disappeared. They had been suppressed by the Soviet or communist system, but they were still there, and they came back in a particularly vicious way. Now, when we think of whether the West is declining, has declined, in one sense, it is manifestly obvious that it must have done, yeah, because uh, whether you measure it by proportions of world economic activity or proportions of other forms of uh, tests that could be applied, 
Of course it's changed. But it's equally true that most of that is relative decline, not absolute decline. You know, in 1945, the United States, I think, was it produced 80% of world output for a, period of, a short period of time because all the European economies had collapsed during the war. And so you could say America declined when that percentage fell. But that, of course, would be absurd. It wasn't declined in any meaningful sense. So what we've essentially seen as the single most important economic reason for the decline of the West is something that we always hoped would happen. The growth of the poorer countries of the world, uh, in Asia and Latin America, to some degree in Africa, uh, gradually uh, improving their standard of living, their economic activity, uh, and therefore being able to claim a very substantial share of overall global economic activity. And that's healthy. That can't be uh, uh, described as a decline of any one part of the world. So that is certainly the case. But it's more than that. There's a geopolitical aspect to this as well. Because the Industrial Revolution began in Europe, uh, and because the European empires flowed from that Industrial Revolution, and the maritime capability of so many European countries enabled them to acquire overseas empires, there was a period at the beginning of the 20th century when a lot of the world uh, was dominated, uh, controlled, directly controlled as empires, uh, by European uh, powers, and when the European empires declined the Amer Americans, not as a colonial power, uh, but in other ways, filled some of that gap. Now, that has obviously changed very, very substantially. But it seems to me that central to our deliberation on these issues is to come to a judgment as to whether what we are seeing is decline or whether we are seeing it as something which is actually a very natural historical phenomenon. That what tends to happen when you look back in history, uh, as well as in more contemporary times, is you get some huge seismic change. The world moves in a particular direction. It appears almost uh, unstoppably. Uh, and uh, people are sometimes optimistic or sometimes depressed. So in, in 1989, after the collapse of communism, you had this extraordinary growth of dem democracy, not just in Eastern Europe, which you might have expected given the end of communism there, uh, but you also, round about the same time, you were seeing a similar uh, dramatic increase in the Far East, countries like South Korea, uh, the Philippines, Taiwan, Indonesia, all of whom had been military or uh, dictatorships or other kinds of dictatorship, throwing off the dictatorial systems and becoming functioning democratic societies, some of which also observed the rule of law. But it wasn't just the Far East and Eastern Europe. It also was Latin America. Uh, Latin America used to be a byword for military juntas and generalissimos and uh, all the way from Argentina and Chile and Brazil uh, throughout Central and Southern America. Today, with the obvious exception of Venezuela and Cuba, uh, every other Latin American country, some not so healthily, have a system that they have uh, their heads of government elected with plural choice uh, and have open systems of government. And in many countries in Africa, now probably at least a dozen African countries have regular free elect, what we would call free elections, uh, with incumbent presidents being thrown out democratically by the ballot box. So the growth of democracy seemed to be unstoppable, hence Fukuyama's remarks. But you know, when I said that you can go back in history to find comparable uh, uh, challenges, uh, what came after the Reformation in Europe in the, in the 16th century? It, came, it was the Counter-Reformation. And the Counter-Reformation was quite successful in its terms, but it didn't push Europe back to where they were before the Reformation. A new equilibrium was formed and has largely survived in the intervening centuries. Uh, think of the conclusion of the French Revolutionary period from 1789 to 1815 after the Battle of Waterloo when Napoleon was overthrown. Uh, the, the Bourbons and the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Prussians and the Russians all created the Holy Alliance to uh, go back to a reactionary system of government and had some success for a period of time. But again, a new equilibrium was formed. And by 1848, the liberal ethos uh, was again pushing forward. So my thesis that I put to you is that something not exactly the same, but something comparable is happening. Uh, that we have had this massive increase in democratic governments and liberal governments and the rule of law over a whole swathes of the globe that never experienced them before. And there has been a reaction. 
because with democracy comes responsibility. And I come to a couple of reasons in particular why I think this reaction has been happening. Uh, and my belief is, not just my belief, my analysis for what it's worth is, that we will go, having gone so many steps in one direction, we, all, we are coming back, but not to where we started, not to where we were. And let me explain why I am perhaps more confident than some may think I should be, that that is what is happening. Uh, first of all, let us look at some of those who argue otherwise. We have heard from Beijing and from Moscow that the authoritarian system of government surely is, delivers the goods, particularly in China. We are told, look at this remarkable change in China. And that has happened under the benevolent um, authority of the Communist Party. And therefore, not that the Chinese model must be exactly followed elsewhere, but it works, and it's worked in a most dramatic way. Well, I don't want to denigrate what's happened in China. <coughs> Many remarkable things have happened. But my first point is that what has happened in China is was what should have happened and would have happened 50 years ago in China if it hadn't been for Mao Zedong, the great cultural revolution, the great leap forward, and all the other nonsense of communism. Why can I say that with confidence? Because you only have to look at other Chinese communities in Taiwan, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, dare I say it, that with the same cultural background, much of the same history in previous centuries have not only achieved 30, 40 years ago what China has achieved in the last five years, but have done so without despotism as well. Now, Singapore is an imperfect democracy, to put it mildly, but Taiwan it functions as an effective democracy, and Hong Kong would love to, given half a chance, as we have seen. But it's not just the Chinese countries. Think of Japan. Think of uh, uh, Indonesia, uh, that certainly as we speak have no intention of going back to military dictatorship or authoritarian systems of government. And therefore, if we notice China particularly, it's not because of some remarkable theory that they've invented of government. It is because of the sheer size of China. If a country of over a billion people does manage to get by essentially abandoning communist economics if it, and accepting what they choose to call um, uh, market economics with Chinese characteristics, a lovely phrase, uh, if they are able then to catch up, which is what they are doing, with the rest of Asia, never mind Europe, uh, that is not some remarkable new system that is relevant to the wider world. And when I come to Russia, in economic terms, Russia is a very sad basket case. If it wasn't for their oil and gas, uh, they would have little to fund their foreign policy. Tsar Alexander in the 19th century uh, said at one occasion that Russia, Imperial Russia, has only two friends, its army and its navy. You could say today that Russia has only two friends today, its oil and its gas. And that, therefore, is not a model for the rest of the world that can be usefully followed. But there is another consideration. Because even these dictatorships like to imply that they follow a democratic model. And so Russia goes through the, not the substance, but the form of elections with candidates, ensuring that only one party can actually win, but nevertheless feeling obliged to try to improve their legitimacy by saying, of course, we are a democratic system of government. And even China has its uh, people's parliament, uh, where everyone votes the same way and puts their hand up when told. And yet they feel the need to have this form. Why not just say, we don't need these things, because unless they're substantive, they're not worth having. So that tells me that there is an insecurity, a basic insecurity, uh, in the leadership of those countries, uh, which will have its uh, uh, impact. Uh, can I just very briefly say something about Brexit uh, before you do? <laughs> and I'm not going to try and go over all the details of it. Most of this audience will know them anyway. But let me try and just offer a view, because one of the questions I'm often asked, particularly if I'm in other countries, is, yes, you, you have a strong Euroscepticism in your country, but there is a strong Euroscepticism in France, There's in Poland, uh, in Hungary, uh, in Sweden and Denmark, uh, 
and other countries. Why is it you are the only country that has actually taken it to the extent of deciding to leave? And that's a fair question. And I think there is at least part of an answer that I can offer you, but I think it's actually a very significant part. And it goes back to the history of the 20th century. It was a rotten century for all the countries of Europe. Uh, you had countries, great countries like Germany, dominated by Nazism and Austria. You had Italy with Mussolini. You had Spain with Franco, Portugal with Salazar. Greece had its Greek juntas. All the Eastern and Central European countries were progressively dominated by communist, communism and the Soviet Union. And even those that escaped that fate, like France or the Netherlands or Denmark, were occupied for six years by Hitler with all the horrors of occupation. So when the EU was formed, originally as the common market, as the European economic community, one often is told, yes, of course, the prime motivation was to make sure you could never have another third world war started from Europe. We cannot have a, another war by, uh, between European countries. And that's true. That was part of the motivation. And it's been an enormous success, particularly the, the Franco-German reconciliation. But there was a second reason, which is as important as the first, but is not so often stressed. And that is that the EU, or European community, when it was first formed, made it abundantly clear that it would only accept as members those that shared its values, that shared the belief in democracy and the rule of law, not, ju not just as terms of language, but substantively. And if you ever gave them up, then you would be required to go elsewhere, as indeed at one stage, a dispute with Poland over what it was doing with judicial independence and with Hungary, Orban, still not resolved, uh, are real issues. So you could say that for many of these countries, which through no fault of their own, had only very, have had only very fragile and limited experience in Europe, put aside the rest of the world for the moment, uh, of, self, uh, of, of democracy, of the rule of law, of parliamentary systems, mostly just since 1945, and in the case of Eastern Europe, only since 1989. Being part of the European Union, apart from all the other reasons, is an insurance policy. Even if you're a Eurosceptic, you put up with all the things you don't like, the loss of self-government, the bureaucracy, and everything else, because ultimately it helps guarantee that you don't go back to the bad old days of dictatorships and despotism and lack of freedom. Now, in Britain, it's not that we discount that argument or that consideration. It's hugely relevant. But it's not an argument you can convincingly use with the British public. You can't, you know, we haven't been invaded for, for literally a thousand years, since 1066. Our rule of law and our freedom has not been interfered with substantively since Oliver Cromwell in the 1600s. Ask yourself why the one other significant country that has not joined the European Union but could is Switzerland, for reasons not that dissimilar to the United Kingdom. They've enjoyed freedom. They weren't dominated by Hitler. They preserved their independence during the war. They see no reason to make the sacrifice of self-government uh, that the EU membership requires. And I think what people in other parts of the world often don't realize, particularly in America, is that the EU is not just an international organization. It is unique in the world in that it has supranational institutions and European law takes precedence over national law. Could you imagine in Washington, the Democrats, never mind the Republicans, Clinton or Obama, never mind Trump, accepting that some international body should actually be able to impose domestic legislation in some areas, not in every area, in some areas in the United States? Of course not. But the same would apply to most of the other countries around the world that are not in Europe. So what Europe is going through is a, is a historic, a remarkable experiment. It's more than an experiment. They've achieved already an enormous, I'm full of praise for it. But you have to be willing to give up an increasing, substantial form of self-government in order to be part of this process. And think of the single currency, a remarkable achievement in its own right. But that means none of the countries concerned have any control over interest rates, over their monetary policy, or all this, so that when they have an economic crisis, as Greece had, uh, as uh, Spain and Portugal have had, as Ireland had, uh, they are only left with massive cuts of public expenditure or huge unemployment.
as a way of resolving the problem. Everything else is controlled. Now, whether that's good or bad, I'm not commenting on this evening. I'm simply saying, you know, that is a huge sacrifice of self-government, which might or might not be worth it, depending on your historical experience. My very final comments, because I said I'd finish my opening remarks by 6 o'clock, and I mean to do so, uh, is, is simply this, that I don't doubt for a moment that as the years go by, uh, the West, however you define the West, is not going to have the kind of prestige, the kind of power, <clears throat> the kind of ability to control the world that it, it did exercise for at least 100 to 150, 200 years. Uh, but that was uh, always inevitable. Uh, and in an interesting way, what is, I think, most significant is that the change from empires, not just the British Empire, but the other European empires, it had some horrific episodes, it had some loss of life, but it relatively spe it did not involve, with the exception of Algeria and one or two other examples of that kind, uh, uh, massive battles. Because if you take, for example, in the case of the United Kingdom, there, we had about 50 dependent territories. And virtually all of them, apart from the United States and the Republic of Ireland, are part of the Commonwealth by their own choice, recognizing the Queen as head of the Commonwealth. Now, that doesn't mean it's a powerful body. It's not a powerful body, but it implies a degree of shared values, of shared history, uh, which people are comfortable with, even many decades uh, later. Now, that is the problem that the Russians and the Chinese have to come to terms with. Are they going to use their new power, like Germany's Kaiser did, to try and expand their power in an open uh, way, or are they going to do otherwise? I hope we'll get an opportunity in the question session one of the, to, to deal with just this final point, which is what we sum up as the West is not just political power, it is liberal democracy. But liberal democracy is not just one thing. It is democratic government and its liberal values, which often combine, but not necessarily. The drama in Hong Kong is because they, even as a British colony with no independence, they did enjoy liberal values. They had independent rule of law, the independent courts, and that's what they're afraid of losing. Hungary today has democratic government. Orban was elected by a, a very substantial majority on the mandate that he's now carrying out. But it is the liberal values that are under threat in a very, very serious way. So I don't myself believe there is a substantial threat to democratic government. That threat could only come from outside the countries concerned. It may appear, but I don't think we have that at the moment, or are likely to have it. Where I think the Europeans in particular have a problem, but also a number of other countries, including the United States, uh, is the liberal value dimension, because there the threat is internal. It is those from within the country, some of whom argue that this is either a, an unaffordable luxury or an unnecessary imposition and wish to have more power uh, to uh, use the majority they achieve in an election as if once you've won an election, you have the power to do everything. Uh, my very final sentence is this. One reason why this country won't go that way is because for 200 years, we have had something called Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Even the opposition in this country is part of the system. It's not winner takes all. And it may not have worked terribly well in the last couple of years, obviously, for all the reasons you're familiar with. But this country has recognized, with all its faults, we have recognized that democracy does not mean 51% get everything and 49% have to live with nothing. The opposition have a legitimate role. And indeed, we have institutionalized that cooperation in, in Northern Ireland uh, because of the particular circumstances there. So with those remarks, let us now move to the second half of this evening. Thank you. Those down there. Thank Great. Thank you. And we'll open this up to audience questions. And as the audience warms up, I thought I would throw a first question in there, uh, which is, so you spoke very eloquently of the, uh, uh, of the issue of liberal democracy and, and how liberal values will sustain in some sense and have, have been in, in some sense the key export of the West to many of these countries. Um, but 
uh, and speaking as an economist, you know, Milton Friedman, who was a great sort of intellectual uh, source of, uh, of, of strength to both Thatcher and Reagan, uh, wrote very famously that those liberal values need economic opportunity mm -hmm. to be sustained. And that without that economic opportunity, those liberal values will fall apart. And, and one of the key sources of the decline of the West in the way that that term might be understood more generally is the stagnating economic opportunities. The fact that, say, real wages in this country or in the United States have effectively flatlined uh, for the last four decades. Um, and, and so can we sustain those liberal values in the absence of those economic opportunities is one of the questions I think we're grappling with. Well, we can sustain them, but only if we recognize that the opportunities are far less when the economy is not doing well, and the governments have to do what they can to assist that. If you think of uh, Roosevelt's New Deal, it didn't destroy American democracy, but that was partly because the system itself recognized the challenge that they were facing and tried to accommodate it. And I think that's been true for most uh, capitalist countries and, uh, that are also democratic ones, uh, that they take that on, on, on uh, board. Uh, I think also when you're talking of liberal values, it also, I think, the single most important component is the rule of law. And let me share with this audience a conversation I had when I was Foreign, foreign Secretary in the immediate prelude to the handover of Hong Kong, which you mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, I had to have a meeting with, the, I had several meetings with the Ch then Chinese Foreign Minister, Chen Chi Chen. And on this particular occasion, about six months before the handover, I went via Hong Kong before I went to Beijing. And the people in Hong Kong I met said, when you see the Chinese minister, will you please tell him that what we're most worried about uh, when we become again part of China is not just will we have more than one candidate to vote for in an election, but will we continue to enjoy the rule of law, independent judges, all the freedoms that this audience well understands that term to refer to. So when I saw the minister, I put to him what I'd been asked to say, and I've never forgotten his answer through the interpreter, but it, it, this is what he said. He said, oh, don't worry, Mr. Rifkind. Uh, we in China, we too believe in the rule of law. In China, the people must obey the law. <laughs> and I said, now hold on a moment, Minister. I said, when we talk about the rule of law, it's not just the people who must obey the law. It's the government must be also obeying the law, under the law. Uh, and um, he not only didn't agree with me, he had the faintest idea what I was talking about. It was inconceivable that a government that has such power should submit to some uh, judges or someone else as to what are the limits uh, on their uh, power. Now, you saw when Boris Johnson tried to parole Parliament uh, for five weeks, the Supreme Court told him, you can't. And he said, OK, if I can't, I won't. Uh, th that is the rule of law functioning. And somebody came up, it wasn't me, and I, I've always thought it's a brilliant way of distinguishing between those countries that have the rule of law and those don't. And it is that those who have it have the rule of law in the other countries, it's ruled by law. And sometimes they pretend the one is the other. But in fact, when you're dealing with Putin in Russia or Xi Jinping in China and people like them, they, what they call rule of law is using the legal system to criminalize political opposition to their policies and thereby impose their will. Now, whatever else that is, that's not the rule of law. So I think even more important than the economic dimension because the economic dimension can work even in illiberal countries. Uh, without the rule of law, then you have uh, a vastly different society, uh, which is the fundamental distinction. And, and sorry, one final point on this. When Xi Jinping talks about Western values, in a sense that's the wrong phrase, we shouldn't acknowledge that. Uh, he says these are values that grew up in Europe, they're not relevant to our experience. Uh, frankly, it's an absurd argument. It's rather like saying, Christianity, or for that matter, Islam, that began in the Middle East, and therefore they're not relevant to any other region in the world. It's ridiculous. Either the values are relevant or they're not. And we know that Western values are universal values, because otherwise Japan, Taiwan, Brazil, and all the dozens of other countries uh, wouldn't be comfortable with them. So China is the exception, not because the Chinese people decided it, but because the Communist Party have held power and are, are, are unwilling to give it up. Okay, great. So... Um, let's take some questions. So uh, if you have a question, again, raise your hand. And so there's, there's, there's a lady in the back. Um, yep. And you've got, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, one of our own MPPs, yes. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm apologizing for my voice uh, having. No 
uh, yeah, have, have some problems. So, um, Sir Malcolm, I'm very especially happy to be here today because um, I was late for the discussion with you when you were in Kyiv uh, back in June uh, this yes. year. Uh, so, uh, I'm originally from Ukraine and uh, I have the following question to you, which I was planning to ask you uh, in June. So, as you probably know, um, back in 1994, uh, Ukraine, was the Kazakhstan and Belarus, gave up its nuclear weapons um, in exchange for security yes. assurances from Russia, United States, and uh, United Kingdom. And, of course, when Russia annexed in 2014 Crimea, um, a lot of people actually said that the West uh, turned its back on Ukraine because no proper reaction followed according to uh, Ukrainian politicians and Ukrainian people. So I would really like uh, to ask sure. you to elaborate on that. Do you think that the West could have done more and, first of all, should have done more in this Okay, <clears throat> very good question. Let me try and respond. What you're referring to indeed happened in 1994. It was called the Budapest Memorandum. It wasn't a treaty. It didn't involve formal legal obligations. It wasn't a defense treaty saying we will come to your defense if X or Y. But it was a memorandum signed, as you rightly said, by Russia, uh, Britain, America and so forth, in which the borders of Ukraine, the territorial borders of Ukraine, as they were when Ukraine became independent uh, two or three years earlier, were recognized by Russia as part of the deal whereby you, not just Ukraine, because there were similar agreements with Kazakhstan and Belarus, said we will not become a nuclear weapon state. So it is undoubtedly the case, and it's one of the most uh, serious uh, violations that Putin is responsible for, because by uh, the question will always be asked, if Ukraine still had had nuclear weapons, would he have dared to annex Crimea? And therefore the cause of non-proliferation of nuclear weapons has been done serious damage uh, by a, a solemn commitment of this kind being simply ignored uh, by the, the Kremlin. Now, you've said that the Western reaction uh, ha was not what you would have wanted. I can understand that for, for obvious reasons. But sh short of going to war with Russia, uh, the West has reacted very, very substantially. Now, I don't think there was ever, in fact, we know for a fact, there was no article, uh, NATO has an Article 5 treaty commitment that says if you're a member of NATO and you're attacked, all the other member states are obliged to come to your defense, including military defense, if that is necessary. Uh, that is not the case in relation to Ukraine or a number of other countries. Uh, so what the West has done is imposed unprecedented sanctions, which continue. And I am banned from going to Russia by Mr. Putin, not just me. I am one of a group of people because we supported the most important sanctions were the financial sanctions, the banking sanctions that were imposed preventing the Russians operating their financial institutions uh, in, the, in the West. Uh, that really hurt them. Uh, and in other ways, supplies have been given to Ukraine. So pretty well everything other than actually going to war with Russia has already been done. And that is largely why Putin has not sought, as he originally expected he would be able to, to extend his territorial control in Ukraine. He had hoped that what he called Novorossiya, would be created a, a swathe of territory from Crimea to Donetsk and Luhansk, including perhaps Odessa on one side and Mariupol on the other. That didn't happen because the Ukrainians resisted it and sanctions were uh, imposed upon him. So I think that's the full, fuller picture of what, of what happened. And this is unfinished business. Okay. So let's take a couple of questions at a time just so that we can um, so we've got a question. I'll try and give shorter answers as well. <laughs> question up front here, and then we've got a question right there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Good evening, Sir Malcolm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I take great reassurance from your comments about seismic shifts in, in the political nature of Europe and Britain. Um, but I've always been a Liberal Democrat, and I'm quite old now. No one's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just... I've been very disturbed over the last year by um, the language that's entered yeah. this country, yeah. and in particular um, in terms of our politics, yeah. which I have not experienced in my lifetime before. Mm. And um, I just wondered if you had any comment on that. Sure. I, I will do it. You want to take yeah. the same question? Right here. Thank you. 
My name is Matthew Scaria, and I work at uh, Harwell Campus. So, Malcolm, you've left me a little confused, and it is my shortcoming. You cited uh, 1989, as I take it as beginning of the decline, in the context of the talk. I'm young enough to remember that uh, 89 and the following decade was the beginning of the new dawn. It was the new world order. And there was relative prosperity in the West and perhaps even globally. Therefore, I'm not quite sure if one can actually associate the 90s with the beginning of the decline of the West. Whereas, when we entered the noughties, there were incursion into the Middle East, 2001, 2003, and your points with regard to the rule of law comes in. And then later on in the decade, we had the, the financial crash. Do you see where, I'm, exactly where, where my difficulty is, is with regard to yeah. the... Uh, to the I, time uh, yes. line If that. I may respond, um, I, I think I may have inadvertently given that impression. I do not believe that 1989 was the beginning of the decline. I'm saying that the factors, what you had in 1989 was the beginning of that huge expansion of liberal values and of democratic government, uh, first in Eastern Europe, but also in parts of Asia, Latin America, and so forth. In the years that followed, partly because of economic reasons, but partly also because there were a lot of people who lost out because of the fall of these old regimes. They were a minority, but they were significant in terms of their political uh, impact. Um, and uh, that's why I was saying that the change is really, let, let us say, six steps forward, two steps back. Uh, so the decline of the West, if you're going to say there has been a decline, actually goes back to 1900, uh, when... Uh, America overtook the United Kingdom uh, in terms of world global power. And most of the European continental countries have economically been less powerful at the global level since then. So uh, if I created an alternative impression, that was my fault <laughs> rather, rather than yours. Um, on your question, sir, um, yes, you, you said that you were deeply concerned by the, uh, the deterioration in values, in language, in relationships, and you could not remember that in your lifetime. Um, I think that what has happened, and it's really because of Brexit you're talking about, I think, uh, is because this is not just an issue that divides politicians. If it did, it would have been resolved by now. It is because the politicians are stretching out to try to accommodate public opinion. And so we have a, an incredible, un, almost unprecedented situation where the Government was split 50-50, where Parliament was split 50-50, mainly my own party, the Conservative Party, but also, as we've seen, the Labour Party uh, as well. And what's more, the nation is split, 52-48. And most of the opinion surveys suggest it's still split, perhaps not exactly the same, but in that way. So what that means is there are, and as we will all know from our own personal experience, families that are divided, communities that are divided, and that's when emotion begins to become more and more important. Now, you said that you had not experienced that before. That's because, like me, uh, you were born after the Second World War. Think of this country, uh, the, the appeasement issue. Chamberlain and his colleagues on one side, Churchill on the other. How do we deal with this problem of Hitler? Do we deal with it by appeasement or by being tougher than we are being? And that split families and created bitterness, and people were deeply uh, concerned and upset. So, uh, and I, in my own personal experience, there's one other example I will give you, uh, and that we also had a referendum on Scottish independence. I am Scottish. I was involved in that campaign on the Unionist side, which won. But the number of people in Scotland who said, our family is divided, you know, we, we've never had known anything like it, people are not talking to each other. And so it's, the, it's, it's not just that we've suddenly deteriorated. It is the issue itself. And if I have one overriding reason why, I, forgive me putting it this way, why I hope Mr. Johnson gets his majority uh, and uh, has a, he's already got a deal, this is a personal view, but uh, is because once we have 
taken a decision consistent with the referendum, left the EU, the temperature will start falling. And now that we've got a new speaker, that's a big plus. <laughs> <laughs> because although Mr. Berko had his merits, uh, calming down a situation wasn't one of them. <laughs> okay, so we've got a couple of questions in the back there. I know I said I would come to you. I will come to you. Yep. Thank you for this talk. Uh, so I'm a Syrian student here, and I was wondering your thoughts on the latest developments in Syria and President Trump mm -hmm. public statements that his con he wants to control the oil and he wants to secure the oil. Okay, and just hand it over here. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Sabah. I'm from Pakistan. My question to you is regarding the rule of law in UK that you just mentioned. When we're talking about rule of law, in uh, UK we see that uh, the judges also practice judicial restraint. My question is that in Pakistan, because of judicial activism, recently we have had to pay an international fine of $6 billion um, in one of the recorded cases. There was um, a gold mine in Balochistan to an international Ethiopian company. So that was the sole decision of a judge. Um, and during the times of judicial activism. So we are all for rule of law and all of that, but um, how do you um, explain, uh, how would you make these judges sort of, sort of subject to judicial restraint also? How do you, uh, uh, you know, put that in place in countries like ours? On, on the Pakistan issue, uh, the problem is not the principle of the rule of law. Uh, the, the problem that you have described is really part of the wider tragedy of Pakistan's history in the last 60 years, that it has been largely a period either of military government or of the military dominating civilian governments, and the ability for any society to have a, uh, both a democratic system and genuine rule of law without the corruption that you are, are, are referring to uh, is in, in, almost impossible uh, if you have that kind of political uh, control. It's very interesting but also very sad if you compare Pakistan with India. I don't mean in relation to the issues that they differ on at the moment. I'm talking about how India, with all its faults, has been able to create a democratic system of government. The military have remained in the barracks and although their judicial system is far from perfect, broadly speaking, people can trust the courts to deliver decisions independent of political interference. Uh, and it's not a coincidence that that has been more successful in India than in Pakistan. Uh, and India has also been more successful with democratic government. I, I think you can't ultimately expect one without the other. Now, you, you may not agree with that point, but do you want to come back on that before I go into Syria? Do, do please. Yeah, this was the reaction during a martial law. I mean, there was a dictator in Pakistan when this uh, um, decision was made. So sure. it was basically against... You well, know, I'm not familiar with the detail, yeah. but I'm saying the broad issue it that you have referred really to area, yeah. uh, can't be divorced from the sad uh, fact that Pakistan, although there are many Pakistanis who have tried and are trying to create pol democratic political institutions permanently with deep roots, uh, they've had some success, but it's not yet embedded. The military is still too strong with all the consequences that flow from that. Uh, if I could turn to the question about Syria, um, I think the way President Trump is, I'm a private citizen, so I can say this, I think it's quite disgraceful. Uh, it's quite disgraceful for several reasons. Uh, where do I start? Where do I stop? But the particular issue at the moment is the extent to which his administration and previous American administrations uh, were willing to work with the Kurds uh, to destroy ISIS and the military component of that relationship was primarily the Kurds themselves. And whatever uh, his the president's relationship with Mr. Erdogan might be, uh, it was a, a betrayal, but it, wasn't, it was more than a crime, it was a mistake. Uh, because it actually led to the first time the Republicans in the Senate distanced themselves from the president. They were so angry and found it so indefensible. So what we now have is a shambles of American policy in Syria because they haven't completed their withdrawal of troops. Indeed, they are currently some being used in various ways in, in the country itself. So they, they have disillusioned their allies, uh, lost the trust of their friends, 
and uh, their enemies have been very pleased, um, which is not exactly an example of brilliant diplomacy, as the current president would seek to imply. Um, but, you know, th that's the sort of person we have, so we have to hope it won't be for too much longer. Okay. Some, some Churchill, uh, people always quote Churchill in this country, but he brilliantly once said, you can always rely on the American government to do the right thing after it's tried every other option. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, do you still want to, yeah, jump in, go, go for it. Yeah. And if there are hands here, just signal to me and I'll come to you in the next round. No? Okay. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name's Toby. I'm an MPP student here. Um, it was interesting to hear you talk about how we should probably be a bit more comfortable about the kind of natural ebbs and flows of, of global power. But at the moment, we see a sort of UK government post-Brexit or mid-Brexit that likes to project itself as a, as a global Britain, so uh, across all elements of foreign policy, whether that's mm. de defence, diplomacy or development. How do you think the UK should be defining itself in this new world order? Okay. Okay. And let's see. Okay. Yes. Right here, the gentleman, uh, second row down. Yeah. Thank you. To, to, your, to your point, if I may, about um, democracy being a universal value uh, and that being a reason why it spread, um, some people reflecting on the, the 30 years since 1989 have said, uh, people who know, the big mistake we made in 1989 was to assume that what we regarded as progress at the time was not irreversible, and that what is being seen in countries like Poland, uh, Hungary in particular that you mentioned, and perhaps the Czech Republic as well, is that there has been a, a turning back in ways that weren't anticipated because of the assumption that democracy was a universal value because it's the value we like in the West. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a perfectly fair comment. Um, I think that... Uh, it is not irreversible, but the more educated your population, uh, the less likely it is to happen, because people who are, have been educated, I don't just mean academically educated, I mean people who've got basic education, literacy, are able to understand what is happening around them, feel they have a, a stake in the society of which they are part, having tasted freedom, having enjoyed the independence that goes with it. I've yet to see a single society which votes to give it up. You know, I've seen it disappear because bad people get into positions of power, either through military force or revolutionary circumstances, which lead to, a, uh, as in Venezuela, for example. So you can lose it. I've yet to see a historical example of a mature democracy or even a relatively immature democracy actually choosing democratically that we don't actually want the system of government. So I think that's worth thinking about. Um, on the first question about the United Kingdom and post-Brexit and so forth, I think there's a very important point here. There's been a tendency in some quarters to say that Brexit is the British equivalent of the decline of liberal values, of uh, global society and all the various other things. Um, I just don't think that's true. Uh, Brexit is... Uh, I voted Remain, incidentally. So I'm disappointed by what happened, and I would rather we'd remained in the European Union for reasons I can explain if anybody wants me to. So I'm not just arguing from my point of view. I'm trying to understand the phenomenon as a whole. And I do not notice in this country <clears throat> any significant decline in liberal values uh, comparable to what we have seen in some other places. We have no equivalent to uh, Le Pen's National Front uh, in France, an openly avowed, uh, more authoritarian party. I mean, Farage is a single issue, and it's not about society as a whole, it's about Brexit exclusively. If, even if you look at Boris Johnson, I've known Johnson for 30, 20 years, and on every issue other than Brexit, where he's been largely opportunistic, his views are as liberal as probably anyone in this room. Not just his views, but his, the way he's governing. Uh, if you look since he became uh, both as Foreign Secretary, but now particularly as Prime Minister, just two or three months, think of the issues that one normally identifies with President Trump's position. 
climate change, denial. Johnson totally disagrees. Ending the Iran nuclear deal, Johnson has sided with the French and Germans in refusing to go along with that. Moving your embassy in uh, Israel to Jerusalem, uh, Britain, under Johnson as well as under Theresa May, refused to follow that. Think of the social issues that dominate a lot of American public debate on abortion, on gun law, uh, on gay issues, gay marriage and so forth. Johnson, on all these issues, is a progressive liberal. In fact, these issues aren't even issues any longer in the United Kingdom. And finally, I could have a much longer list, but finally, uh, Trump has identified his position as being um, against the WTO, in favor of tariffs whenever you can use them, and only interested in bilateral trading negotiations. <laughs> the position of the Brexiteers, never mind the government, uh, everybody else, of the Brexiteers in Britain was, don't worry if we have no deal, we will rely on the WTO. That's the way, that's what most of the world does. The World Trade Organization. Now, whether that was a good idea or a bad idea is not the point I'm making. Far from following the American solution of uh, Britain alone, <laughs> make Britain great again, um, we haven't even had a debate about tariffs in this country, as opposed to free trade, since the 1920s, 100 years ago. Even Mr. Corbyn, who I don't approve of in much respects, uh, is not proposing to uh, undo the free trade arrangements that uh, that we, we benefit from. The, the, the tragedy is that in order for us to participate in the internal market of the EU, which Mrs. Thatcher helped create, uh, you have to be a full member of the EU. Uh, if, if our referendum on the EU had been purely about economic and trading issues, we wouldn't be leaving. Uh, the factors that led to our departure, or likely departure, were to do with the increasing authority of the EU on social policies, on migration policies, on, on a range of other things. Okay. Um, so we've got a couple. Let's take uh, on this side, both MPPs here and then back there. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sir Malcolm. Uh, my question uh, is, how much do you think is the West responsible for the lack of economic progress and, and the political progress, as you term it, as a liberal uh, Democrats? Um, so how much is what responsible? How, how much do you think is the West responsible um, for the lack of economic and political development of the recently decolonized, and, uh, you know, East? So uh, my understanding is, since they have, re they have been recently decolonized, they might Which not countries are you thinking of in particular? Uh, uh, let's say Indo-Pak, let's say uh, the Middle East for that matter. Okay. Okay. Right. And back there. Uh, thank you, and Kirsty, I'm also an MPP student. Um, I was somewhat intrigued to hear, you, and, and I hope reassured, to hear you say that you considered the world to be a safer. Could you speak a bit louder, please? Uh, that you considered the world to be a safer place now. Um, in, in view of rising nuclear capabilities in tremulous states, increasing divisions across uh, along yeah. ideological lines, in, even within our own country. And uh, certainly there's a legacy of Russo-American competitiveness, which is hamstringing the Security Council and leading to various proxy wars. Gorbachev yesterday or a few days ago called for complete nuclear disarmament across the world as a matter of urgency. And I, I would welcome your comments as to whether that's realistic or advisable, <coughs> plausible, etc. Sure. Uh, on, on the first question about... Um, uh, former colonial territories, most of them are actually now showing very substantial economic progress, particularly over the last 20, 30 years. And one of the benefits of the end of the Cold War and the end of the ideological alternative of communism was it became easier, for example, a country like India, which was always ambivalent about capitalism, claiming to be socialist, but in practice being more capitalist, but not very comfortable with that. These inhibitions largely have disappeared. And that applies to many parts of Africa as, as well. So you mentioned the Middle East. The Middle East is the Middle East has had the curse of oil. Um, that it's a bit like Russia. You know, when you have all these revenues coming from natural resources, you don't have the spur of creating uh, the economic reforms that would enable you to make a more modern economy. I mean, Russian economy used to be larger than the Chinese, and uh, now they're peripheral. Uh, 
in, in, in comparison. So I think that is, is uh, part of the explanation. Uh, on the question of, of nuclear weapons, what I was wanting to say about the end of the Cold War, <coughs> during that whole period of the Cold War, wars normally don't break out unless there is some fundamental conflict between the two participants that then results in physical conflict. And when you have two global ideologies battling for supremacy, which is more or less what happened from Stalin onwards, uh, and when you have nuclear weapons that could destroy the planet, then you know, of all the nuclear weapons in the world, at the end of the Cold War, do you know how many nuclear warheads there were? 47,000. Today there is 15,000 most of which were removed or disappeared in the 1990s, less in the recent past. Still far too many, but of the 15,000 that exist, although there are six or seven nuclear weapon states, two of them have 90% of the nuclear weapons, Russia and the United States. So I think one is entitled to say that although Gorbachev, whether you take what he said literally, the warning he gave was entirely reasonable because of the very bad relationship between Russia uh, and the West uh, and both uh, the nuclear weapons, in theory, uh, arms control agreements have largely disappeared. But I still do not see evidence that would support the argument that it is as dangerous or more dangerous than during the Cold War period. Quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. Uh, whatever I think of Mr. Putin, I don't think much of Mr. Putin, uh, he is not a warmonger in the sense of wishing to have an all-out war either with the West or with anyone in particular. He's an opportunist. He had an opportunity in Crimea. Uh, he had an opportunity in Syria. And he used them very skillfully in the short term. Uh, but that is the kind of way he, he operates. So uh, I go along with the view that there are still far too many nuclear weapons, but they can only be removed by multilateral negotiation. Multi, not unilateral. That's unrealistic. But multilateral negotiations ought to be given much more priority. I very strongly endorse that. Okay, so we've got a hand back right, right next to you there, and then we've got one right up front here. In 2001, China was uh, admitted to the World Trade Organization. In hindsight, was this the right thing to do? Okay, great, and right up front here. My question is a little sensitive, so I would like to ask you uh, about your opinion whether democracy and uh, communism are absolute rivals, uh, as there are different forms of government um, in, in political theories. Uh, is the democratic, in democratic government the only appropriate form of government? Thank you. Well, the short answer is that the are alternatives that cannot be reconciled. Uh, various attempts were made to get democratic communism. Uh, if you remember, uh, Dubček in Czechoslovakia talked about communism with a human face. Uh, I remember when Gorbachev came to the United Kingdom, uh, his view at that time, not nowadays, but at that time, he still thought of himself as a convinced communist. And he believed that the mistake the Soviet Union had made was Stalin and what was old Stalinism. And he had convinced himself that Lenin was somehow a more acceptable potential Democrat. Well, I'm never entirely convinced by that argument. Uh, but, the te but when you think about it, it wasn't that communism as an economic theory uh, required the kind of totalitarian tyranny that Stalin presided over, but the, the experience of the world has been that communism does mean that. There's never been any attempt, or maybe an attempt, there's never been any realization of a system that could be credibly described as communist, but which was also democratic. Because dem democracy implies, that the, or it doesn't imply, it requires the electorate to be able to remove the government if it believes that it's failing. And if you're a communist believing in Marxist ideology, how can you fail if you are doing what is historically inevitable? You know, the whole concept of Marxism was that there are certain human developments which are materialistic, they, are, they come about not by choice, they, become a, they are inevitable, and uh, it was their destiny uh, to preside over their implementation. So communists did not allow pluralism 
to work. What if Marxism is just one theory in the communist whole family? Well, Marx wouldn't have recognized many of the communist states that claimed him as, a, as a, uh, an inspiration. Uh, of course, that you can have as many theories as there are people. But I think you were asking, uh, is there any reason to believe that you can combine communism with democracy? And you, to do so, to do so, you'd have to start off with the majority of the electorate wanting it uh, and continuing to want it uh, over a very long period of time. And uh, the Chinese government claim, the current Chinese government claim that's what they've achieved. But they are certainly not going to test that by inviting the Chinese people to vote and express a genuine, honest opinion as to whether they agree with them or not. Now, if you are delivering economic progress, then the public will let you get away with dictatorship a lot longer than if you've got economic failure. And what the Chinese government are terrified of is now that growth is slowing down, what happens if they are not able to deliver the kind of economic progress they've done in the last 20 years and they don't offer a democratic uh, solution to how China can then deal with that new situation? Uh, that's when they are in deep trouble. And that is effectively what's happened in Venezuela. The government having created economic mayhem, refuses to leave, and you get a revolutionary situation. Now, the, your first question, sir, you was, remind me. It was about, oh, go ahead. You have a mic? Just, uh, just give me one word that will remind me. The, the WTO, WTO, China. Under China and? The WTO. The WTO, that was it, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I'm not an expert in trade policy, but as I understand it, uh, the WTO normally requires countries not simply to uh, have a general system in support of free trade, but to allow comparable access to their own markets as they are hoping to have in other people's markets. And uh, in various ways, the Chinese government has not been delivering that. Uh, China, the, the ability for companies from other countries in the world to penetrate Chinese markets is very, very limited. So. The short answer to your question is that uh, I think the agreement to allow China into the WTO, it was taken for the best of political reasons at a time when people believed that China was on an inexorable route towards liberalization and a more open society. I think if people had realized then what we now know, maybe, maybe we should have done. But if we had realized then, then WTO might not have been uh, so amenable. Okay, great. We'll take a final question right here. Also MPP. Thank you. I'm from Japan and a student in this MPP. Um, in recent years, um, I guess the universal values such as freedom, democracy, human rights, and um, are like undermi have been undermined as the the West declines in. Re as the West declines in the relative term, I mean, especially in the economy. And uh, it is, um, and, uh, and th this tendency is uh, clear. If you look at the uh, behaviors of countries, including Russia and China, um, but the thing is, it is expected that the West will um, grow less than other em emerging countries, and this uh, relative decline will continue. So my question is, uh, what will be the Britain's strategy to tackle this problem? Uh, well, I mean, given that the uh, West will sh keep shrinking in economic terms. Well, I think we have to, from now on, distinguish between the West as a geopolitical concept and Western values, which can be better described as universal values. If you treat the term the West as a geopolitical concept, then the uh, largely because of the Cold War, the alliance between the United States and Europe, uh, which also dominated much of the rest of the world, uh, was a political alliance based on common interests and common defense requirements. Uh, that cannot survive in its previous form because increasingly the two superpowers will be the United States and China where the geopolitical issues are bound to be different and the alliances that are developed from that are, are bound to be different. Uh, Japan will be intimately, obviously, involved in uh, however that develops. Um, and in fact, what we are seeing uh, 
it's not just the Far East, as it's called. It is a, the creation of an Indo-Pacific rim of countries from India to Japan and South Korea that are sharing activity of a political or military kind to a way they never did in the past. Uh, very recently, or fairly recently, for the first time in history, there was a joint Indian-Japanese naval exercise. Now, what do India and Japan have in common that requires a naval exercise apart from China? Uh, you know, that, that obviously is the, the common thread. And that's something that people in Beijing have to ponder, that while they are far more powerful than any individual country of the, amongst their neighbors, they could be at risk of creating either a formal or more likely an informal alliance of very important countries, Japan, India, the Southeast uh, ASEAN countries, uh, all of whom share deep anxiety as to what China is likely to do. And I don't think the Chinese government would welcome such a united opposition to their foreign policy, but that's what will happen if they don't change their foreign policy. Uh, when it comes to Western values, I think we should stop using that term because it is, they're not, they may have started in the West, uh, used the parallel just as Islam or Christianity started in, the, in, in, in Saudi Arabia or the Holy Land, but they're universal just as the religions are universal. And that is proven by the countries in every continent that practice these values uh, very successfully, including Japan. So I'll uh, bring up a final question, but before that, I'll just give you a footnote on this point about democracy and, and communism. And there are two Indian states that had uh, democratically elected communist governments, Kerala, Kerala and Bengal, for yeah. almost 40 years yeah, each. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if there's anything to learn but, from that. But they didn't implement communism. They had, well, they had, no, well, yes. they didn't become communist in the, in the societies, same, yes, yeah, in the same but they were, it was a communist party, right. quite right. But uh, I think my, my final question is one that I think may be worth reflecting on in this institution. So we are trying to build a program for uh, those who aspire to careers in public service from across the world. And each year we bring together in the MPP program 120 people from you know, nearly 50 different countries that span in age from the 20s to the 40s. And, and these are people who are remarkably committed to the service of government, but uh, across many different systems. So if you were in, in our shoes and we were crafting a curriculum that brought all of these people together, what are the values that we should be teaching here? <laughs> How about starting with academic freedom? <laughs> <laughs> We've got that. Yeah. No, no, well, you know, it's, a, it's a valid point because one of the most disturbing developments of the recent past has been how various institutions, some of which are universities, have submitted to Chinese pressure. You know, as to how they, and you get, uh, I, I found, I've been very saddened by, I mean, China's a fantastic country. It's a huge, uh, uh, successful example of 3,000, 4,000 years of history, and yet, they have chosen when some miserable little airline somewhere has a brochure on flights to Taiwan and doesn't mention it's part of China, uh, they are threatened with every possible sanction and punishment. And uh, universities, I'm not saying this one, but I'm simply saying there have been a number of examples of universities compromising on academic freedom, either because they depend on or think they depend on Chinese funding and it's usually Chinese, it's sometimes from other countries, Saudi or whatever, it's not just China. Uh, and that is desperately important because if that ever became uh, institutionalized, then the universities would cease to be true to themselves. So, so this university is fortunate in that it hasn't had that problem and it has a reputation that it can stand on that withstands that. That's right. So if we go beyond that one issue, what, okay. what else would you... In terms of values, you yes, say? yeah. I think that uh, the point we were discussing earlier about are there universal political mm. values, that doesn't necessarily mean if there are that they have to be the kind that the West has developed. I mean, these things constantly evolve. Mm. There's a constant dynamism here. But is the world slowly moving towards a sharing of values? And I think to a serious extent it is. Mm. And I think it's three steps forward, one step back. Mm. 
It won't, it won't be uninterrupted, and we're seeing that at the moment. But uh, if you compare, you, you've always got to compare what's happening in your own age, not just to five years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago, but to 100, 200, 300 years ago. And if you look at that, whether it's European history or Asian history or any part of the world, the overriding uh, conclusion is a dynamism in a particular direction. Mm. And I see no reason to be pessimistic that that has somehow come to a stop. I was once told the difference between the optimist and the pessimist. The pessimist believes things couldn't be worse. The optimist knows they could be. <laughs> so I'm an incurable optimist. Great. Uh, that is a wonderful note to end on. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm reminded that uh, as, as, as we close that I'm in august company of Americans that have overstated the tenures of their British guests. And, uh, and I, uh, when, um, <laughs> when, when Queen Elizabeth visited the United States for the American Bicentennial, uh, president uh, George H. W. Bush was uh, president at the time. I believe uh, welcomed him, welcomed her, and congratulated her uh, for the 200-year reign. <laughs> uh, 200 and, years. Well, because it was the the bicentennial. Oh, the bicentennial. Yes, yes. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. So, um, so in that uh, in in that august company, I, I want to thank Sir Malcolm uh, to, for for his visit here to the Blavatnik School and for that very engaging and robust uh, set of ideas that have allowed us to, uh, I guess, uh, span the globe in the set of issues that we've covered this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.